Well, good evening and welcome to another presentation from the Halia Diet. This is Paul Malkmus, president of Halia Diet, and we want to welcome you this evening. It's a beautiful evening in October. It's amazing how quickly this year is going, but tonight's topic is a real great one on melatonin. Dr. Donaldson has put some information together and, and um, I think you'll be really impressed with what he has. And, you know, most of us think of melatonin as a sleep aid, but it's so much more than that. And I can't wait to, to see what Dr. Donaldson has to share with us. But before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and just open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this evening and we thank you for this opportunity to share um, this message, Lord. We pray that um, it'll help some people, inspire people, and that um, through the message here that people will be um, living healthier lives. We pray that uh, the communications all work and um, give Dr. Donaldson the words. Bless our evening in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Dr. Donaldson has been with um, Howie Diet since 1998 in the beginning. And um, he's a Cornell um, graduate, Cornell University in chemical engineering. And his role is research director of the Howie Diet. He's conducted, conducted many studies, published numerous articles and papers. Um, some of the studies started out with B12. Then he's done a lot of enzyme testing, and he actually became the authority on testing for enzymes and products and put together a website basically showing different um, enzyme activity for products. So he's been real fundamental in not just helping guide the principles of the Halia diet, but also in product recommendations and product integrity. So it's been a privilege to work with Dr. Donaldson since 1998. And it's an honor to have him with us this evening. So welcome, Dr. Donaldson. Well, thank you, Paul. Hope you all can hear me okay here. And we're going to get into this. Melatonin. Talking about what else does melatonin do besides help you sleep well? So we'll get into it. We'll have time for questions afterwards. So you may have a couple of questions because some of this is pretty new information for you. It'll take me a little bit to absorb it and then wrap my head around some of this here. So we're going to talk about what melatonin is. We'll look at some of the human results of melatonin, cancer. Talk about the Warburg effect. Some of you may, you've heard of it before and you kind of understand what it is. We're going to talk about what it is in more detail. And then some evidence of the Warburg effect and melatonin, what they've done with lab studies. And then extend that to beyond cancer as well. Looking to see what we can learn there and just get a takeaway message. Simple, I'm not trying to tell you everything here. Once you one simple thing, and when you're done, you probably want to take some melatonin, be my guess. Or at least, you know, turn off all your lights at night if you're younger, and just make sure you get good rest away from light so that you make all the melatonin you're supposed to make. And we should have some time for a QA and a at the end, at the end here. So let's jump into it then, melatonin. Melatonin is made by the pineal gland during the dark part of the day. And it's just a signal when it gets dark, the receptors inside your cell send a signal to the SCN, the superchiasmatic nucleus, and it tells your body that it's dark outside. So you have chronobiology, things that happen in the daytime and things that happen at night. And it's, you know, it prepares you for the things that you ought to do at night, like going to sleep. It doesn't knock you out like a drug. It just opens a sleep gate. So you're ready to relax, wind down and go to sleep. So common uses for melatonin is that it's just promoted as a sleep aid. You know, if you go try to buy some, that's what they do. They just promote it for you to get better sleep. You know, if you're having trouble sleeping, try melatonin. It doesn't actually work that well for everybody. Maybe about 60% 60, 60 of the people that try it actually get benefit that way. But there's many more benefits to it. It's a nighttime antioxidant as well. And it's... You know, you take vitamin C in the daytime and, and all your foods and stuff. Melatonin works at night when you're asleep. So that's the common uses for melatonin. But there's a lot more to melatonin that we, have, that we haven't really talked about very much. In the body, where does melatonin come from? We've already mentioned the pineal gland. The pineal gland is up in your brain, outside of the blood-brain barrier. But it makes and releases melatonin into the bloodstream. So as it's making melatonin, it goes and 
it's a hormone in that case because it's going through the whole body telling everything that it's dark outside. But there's another source of melatonin as well. And that's in the mitochondria. Almost every cell of your body in the mitochondria there make melatonin as well. That's right, just in the mitochondria of each cell here. And I'm not gonna get into the, the research that explains how they figured that out. But they thought initially the melatonin was just in the bloodstream and it just came around every night. When they started looking, they find out the enzymes that make melatonin are right there in the mitochondria. And when you add serotonin, which is a precursor for melatonin, the serotonin is metabolized into melatonin. So the mitochondria do indeed make melatonin there. Now the melatonin there doesn't go throughout the body, doesn't go into the bloodstream. It just stays right in the cell. A lot of it stays right in the mitochondria doing its different duties there. A lot of it is as an antioxidant and some different signaling things that melatonin does as well. So it turns out that only about 5% of the melatonin in your body comes from the pineal gland. The other 95% is made throughout the body everywhere, all over the place. So it turns out you get a lot more melatonin than you actually thought about. There's a lot more going on there with the melatonin. Now, what about melatonin and cancer? Well, it turns out 20 years ago, we put together a protocol with Oasis of Hope Clinic and that included 20 milligrams a day of melatonin because with, even then, early 2000s, we knew that melatonin was helpful with cancer. And I went back and looked and I found 18 randomized controlled trials looking at melatonin and cancer as well. These are just human studies. There's a lot more done in animals and so on, but just looking at the human studies, there's one particular doctor in Italy, um, Professor Lasani, I think he was a doctor. He worked with a lot of um, advanced cancers. And often the patients would get to a point where they're failing treatment, the treatment wasn't working. And so he was allowed to do more experiments with them. And so he would try melatonin and just, you know, adding it in the evening, 10 to 20 milligrams in the evening, just to see what would happen. And he did, you know, of these 18, I think he has more than a dozen of these studies in here. And they found longer survival times, better quality of life, when the people took melatonin. So they vibed a little longer. If you have advanced cancer that's already failed treatment, you have to do more than just take melatonin. So they didn't have like, you know, live 20 years or something like that. But they did live longer and the treatments that they were taking were less toxic to the rest of the body. So the treatments may have helped out their cancer more and that race to kill the cancer before you kill the patient, they helped out their bodies a little bit more so they could survive that therapy that the doctors were giving them. So we already know that melatonin has a positive effect on cancer here, just from studies working with people here. So let's talk a little bit about the Warburg effect. The Warburg effect is something you've heard about. It's named after Otto Warburg. In 1956, he published his research on that. And he found that the Warburg effect was what we call fermentative metabolism. In this case, the, the cells would just use simple glycolysis. There's a little bit of biochemistry, but you don't have to understand all the biochemistry to get the message here. But they would just go into a simple glycolysis metabolism instead of going through the long cycle of the TCA cycle through the mitochondria. It's more efficient, but it takes longer and it's more effective. It produces more ATP out of each molecule of glucose. If you're just using the fermentative metabolism, you get two ATPs for every glucose. I think that's what it is. If you go through the whole TCA cycle, you get like 36. So it's way more efficient use of glucose. But cancer cells have a growth advantage when they use the, the fermentative metabolism. They suck up a lot of glucose. They actually take more lipids into their cells and they generate more five carbon sugars from this pentose phosphate pathway as well. So they're able to make all the structure they need to grow quickly, to grow fast. They make all the membranes they need, all the DNA they need, and oxygen's not a limiting factor for their growth. They don't really need a whole lot of oxygen to do that. Whereas if you're using the whole oxidative phosphorylation process, you need a lot more oxygen as well. That's the Warburg effect there. So there's more details there. 
on that in this next slide here. And if we go through this a little bit, it may be a little bit overwhelming to look at all of this, but talk about it a little bit. The Warburg effect is really the basic underpinnings of the PET scan. Now, PET scans are used for diagnosing cancer all over the place. And all that is, is just a radio labeled glucose that you take. And wherever the sugar goes, that's a hot spot. And they pick it up on the scan from the radio label. And that's probably cancer because it's metabolizing glucose very quickly. So that is the hallmark. One of the main hallmarks of cancer here is this increased glucose. When they do that, they excrete a lot more lactic acid that leads to acidic microenvironment. Down on the bottom, the acidic microenvironment here leads to greater invasiveness, metastasis of the cancer, and it's able to avoid immune surveillance as well. That's all from the glucose uptake. In the process of the Warburg effect, you have hypoxia. You have less oxygen in the area around it, and that creates a larger amount of the HIF1 alpha, which increases the amount of PDK, decreases PDC. I'll talk about that more in a little bit here, but that, that inhibits the TCA cycle. That inhibits the, the uptake of pyruvate from glycolysis into the, into the mitochondria. When the PDC goes down, that's the pyruvate dehydro, dehydro, dehydrogenase complex. That's why we call it PDC, because it's hard to say. When that's decreased, there's less of the TCA cycle, less oxidative phosphorylation, and less melatonin synthesis. That all leads to more cancer growth. When the mitochondria is making less melatonin, there's a decrease in SIR23, that's a sirtuin. Those, those enzymes, those proteins are associated with longevity. Not in all the effects of the SIR23, but bad sign there. Intracellular pH also increases, leading to cell proliferation. I mentioned the pentose phosphate pathway. That leads to more nucleotide synthesis, less re um, reactive oxygen species, less apoptosis. So cells keep on growing. The cells also use more glutamine for energy as well. And that leads to more cell proliferation. And I already mentioned the decrease in the extracellular pH. All these things are incorporated into what we call the Warburg effect where they're just using aerobic glycolysis here. And they're, they're not using anything from inside the mitochondria at all to go through this. So that's the Warburg effect. And that's what we're looking at here and the effect of melatonin. Melatonin is in the middle of that. And that's what we want to get into here. So in 2014, an experimental group looked at what would happen with mice and light at night. They already knew beforehand that melatonin somehow disrupted the DNA synthesis process, and they wanted to know more about that. So their test was to expose the mice to light at, during the night. The control group got 12 hours of darkness, 12 hours light, 12 hours darkness, 12 hours light, and so on. But the test group had some light on at night. It was dim light, it wasn't bright, bright light, but enough to suppress the, the release of melatonin in the mice. And they wanted to just see what would happen there. And sure enough, the tumors did grow faster here, but they looked more than just at the growth of the tumors. They wanted to know about the metabolism. And they found in the control mice, the nighttime metabolism changed back to a more normal metabolism here. But in the mice that were exposed to light during the night, their metabolism did not change, did not cycle back and forth. So at night, what we get here, melatonin levels, when you turn the light on, so here's the, the melatonin concentration on the bar there. The control group during the night, that's the, the black or the red zone here. At night, melatonin levels go up, go down in the daytime, go back up at night. The ones who have light at night suppress the release of melatonin. So they have very little melatonin through the night there. So that's the effect on the melatonin. That affects the metabolism. Look at the glucose levels. This is just a glucose throwing flowing through the mouse, so the, through the arteries here. So hyperglucose levels here, elevated glucose, much higher, it's not cycling so much, but it's way elevated here. Insulin, same thing. Here you're getting cyclical effects where it's lower at night, but all the levels are significantly higher than the control levels. 
You know, during the night, they go way down, close to zero. But uh, mice exposed to light at night are still elevated levels. Their, their low is about the same as the high for the control mice. When you have high glucose levels, high insulin levels in, a, in an animal or a person, it's going to lead to more growth of something, especially tumors. So you look at the, the uptake of total fatty acids. Again, you get a cyclical effect on the controlled mice. When the melatonin increases, the fatty uptake decreases here. They become less like tumors during the night. They become normalized. They, they act like normal cells. The mice exposed to light during the night, they don't change their tumor cells all the time. If you look at just one specific um, fatty acid, linoleic acid, mirrors just what we saw on total fatty acids. So it's not cycling at all. Glucose uptake, glucose uptake for the mice exposed at night doesn't change. It's the same all the time. They act like tumors all the time. The control mice, when you add in the melatonin during the night, the cells normalize. Glucose levels go down. And they go up during the daytime and go back down at night. So these are part-time tumors here. That's what you're looking at. You're looking at part-time tumors. So DNA uptake. Thymidine, that's one of the nucleotides they're taking up for making DNA. Again, the control mice cycle. The mice exposed to light at night, they don't cycle at all. They are tumors and act like tumors with the Warburg effect, full effect, all the time. Again, the DNA content is very high in there, but it cycles in the midst of the control mice here. And tumor growth, you know, when you expose them to light, the tumors reach six grams here very, very quickly. And it takes, you know, quite a bit longer for them, for the, the tumors in the control mice to reach there. Because they're part-time tumors. These guys, when they grow full-time all the time, 24 hours a day, they grow very quickly here. But if you suppress that growth with melatonin during the night, the growth takes a lot longer. So here we are, we're able to change the metabolism by exposure to melatonin. So what this looks like here, just here, here's a light phase or on the left side, on the right side, the dark phase, we have active melatonin pathway. We don't have melatonin around, it's not going through the cyclical AMP. Um, that single molecule uh, has an effect on the mem membrane transporter for the linoleic acid, increases, Increases the signals downstream from that. It causes phosphorylation of these molecular signals. You get an increase of the Warburg effect. Lipid signaling increases, all resulting in more cell pro proliferation and tumor growth. When you have melatonin, it suppresses this signal molecule here. You get less linoleic acid in the cell, less signal downstream from all of that. And that inhibits the lipid signaling and inhibits cell proliferation and tumor growth, all from the effect of melatonin at the beginning there. So big difference between daylight and dark, between no melatonin and melatonin being available then. So this group went on and published a second experiment in 2016. And here they take nude rats and they put a xenograft of a tumor onto those. So nude rats don't have much of an immune system, so you can graft on a, a human tumor onto them. In this case, it was a leiomyosarcoma. It's a soft tissue cancer. And they did something different in this case here. They didn't expose the, the mice or the rats to daylight and light at night. They actually took women and they gave them 65, 75 micrograms of melatonin. Then an hour later, they took a blood sample from them. That gave them, one hour later, gave like an upper level of the physiological concentration to melatonin around 600 picograms per mil. So, you know, it didn't actually take a whole lot of melatonin, 75 micrograms, pretty small amount. But anyways, that was enough for the experiment. And then they perfused those tumors with the blood. So they ran the blood through the tumors and just see what was going on with the metabolism of the tumors there. So normally these tumors are very aggressive. And when you just give them normal blood without melatonin in them, they keep growing, they're very aggressive. 
and you can see that metabolism just keep going on. When you add melatonin to the blood and give that to the tumors and perfuse the tumors with those, there's a shift in, in the metabolism and it goes back to normal. The Warburg effect is no longer um, going on and they behave like normal cells. Here's some of the data from that. Here's this single molecule, this cyclical AMP, the control ball, the control rats, you know, it's 1.5 melatonin, significantly less. If you put this other molecule with the melatonin, this molecule blocks the receptor for melatonin. So melatonin is not getting into the cells. And then it goes part way up here. Fatty acid uptake is 4.5. It's basically zero under melatonin. It's backed up to about four when you block the receptor for melatonin. Uh, linoleic acid uptake, 1.6. Zero and about 1.5 again. So it's very close. You know, when you add this, you're making something specific saying it's not just something else, but I'm blocking the receptor for melatonin. So it is the melatonin having the effect because it's not able to get into the cell. So that was another confirmation that what they were looking at really was due to melatonin and not something else. If you look at this 13 hode signaling molecule downstream from the linoleic acid. Arterial supply is not there, but the venous output, so it wasn't coming in, it's being put out by the tumor here. When you add melatonin, it's not detected. But when you block melatonin or it's not present, you know, high levels of it. And making DNA, it's much higher in the control and the blocked melatonin group and the DNA content as well. So you're affecting tumor metabolism by adding melatonin to the mix there. Glucose uptake, same kind of thing. You know, four here, 1.8 back to four when you block melatonin receptor. Lactic acid, it's producing a lot of lactic acid here, not so much here when you expose it to melatonin. And you block melatonin, it's making lactic acid again. So there, let's look at what we've seen so far here. Melatonin, we've known from the research with people that it has helped people with cancer, but we didn't really know how. We just know you give them melatonin and it seems to work. Here, these experiments help us see how it affects the, the cancer here, how it actually reverses the Warburg effect in these tumors here. And we've also mentioned that healthy cells make mitochondria. Cancer cells don't make melatonin in the mitochondria because it's not going through there. So you can change the cancer cell and change its metabolism by adding melatonin to it. But cancer cells do not make melatonin in the mitochondria. So that's what we know about cancer, but there's more to the Warburg effect than just cancer here. What turns out it's seen in other disease states too. And it could be that all the positive effects that get reported by people using melatonin that the mechanism might be through reversing the Warburg effect. So when people go to sleep at night or take melatonin, you know, they go to sleep at night in the dark and they're young and healthy or they're older and they're healthy and they're getting melatonin, that's reversing the Warburg effect that's going on in the daytime. But this might be a, a unifying mechanism for understanding how melatonin works. And that's what Russell Ryder was, was explaining in the recent work that, that I'm talking about here. So what we see here is that disease cells are normal about half the time when it's dark in the presence of melatonin. So you might actually say, and some groups have actually said that you know, disrupting the dark with light during the night actually is a disease causing factor here. It's actually carcinogenic. It's actually, it's actually carcinogenic to be exposed to light during the night. So we know that Synthesis of melatonin, like many things, decreases with age. That's part of the trouble with so many things that we have is, you know, diseases all increase with age. Melatonin is one of those factors there. Well, here's a list of cancers that Russell Ryder talked about. They've shown all of these cancers, cancers display the Warburg effect, and all of them have been reversed by using melatonin, at least it's, you know, whether it's in people, I don't think it's all in people, these are, are um, cancer cell lines. And they 
and they expose them to melatonin and it reverses the Warburg effect on all of these here. You know, even sarcoma, uh, bone cancer, breast cancer, liver cancer, uh, brain cancer, thyroid cancer, lung cancer, prostate, ovarian, colorectal, pancreatic cancer, cervical and stomach cancer, melanoma, myeloproliferative cancer, bladder, endometrial, renal cell carcinoma, and the one we talked about, the leiomyosarcoma. And maybe there's some other cancers that are on here. But most solid tumors, if it's displaying the Warburg effect, they will be reversed by melatonin here because that's what melatonin does. That's how it works. But there's non-cancer diseases also that display the Warburg effect. And these also have been shown to be reversed by melatonin here. You have disorders of the central nervous system, things like multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington disease, ALS, Parkinson's, all get benefit from using melatonin. Uh, kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease, and polycystic kidney disease, glaucoma, fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, all affected positively by melatonin, reversing the Warburg effect. Tuberculosis and septic shock. You know, septic shock, and you know, that's that's a huge killer in the emergency room and people, have, you know, even with the, the virus, COVID virus, there's been trouble with that too. Oh, look, there's other virus conditions also that are affected and reversed by melatonin as well, including SARS-CoV-2. So there it is. And you'll notice in the last two years, if you've been paying attention, that melatonin has shown up on a lot of alternative medicine, medical protocols as something to add to your protocol to help you overcome infection with the COVID virus. So it's way more than cancer here. Like, okay, who wouldn't benefit from taking some melatonin at this point? Uh, there's none of those things on that list that I would like to have myself and probably you wouldn't like to have either. So here, let me give you one more picture here. And some of the writings here, a little small, but we'll walk through it here. This, so this is what's going on inside the mitochondrial and the pyruvate metabolism. So inside the gray part here, this is the mitochondria. Outside of the white part, this is the cytosol here. This is outside the mitochondria inside the cell. Here's glucose here. It's metabolized the pyruvate here. Pyruvate can go into the cell into the mitochondria, or it can be metabolized further to lactic acid here. If you're working with just the, the Warburg effect, it, glucose is gonna go straight to lactic acid and nothing goes in to the mitochondria here. The pyruvate, there's a signaling process here that the PDK, that's the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, it inhibits the uptake of the membrane, um, the MPC, the channel for pyruvate to get into the mitochondria. It will block that process into the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex here. It inhibits that. Melatonin here, melatonin inhibits the HIF1 alpha factor, that hypoxia fac factor, destabilizes that, and that will reduce the level of PDK. When PDK is reduced, it disinhibits this and pyruvate is able to flow into the mitochondria here. Pyruvate here is metabolized into acetyl coenzyme A. This is fed into the citric acid cycle, which produces the electrons, which get turned into ATP with a process of the oxidative phosphorylation here. Now that's a fair bit of biochemistry here. There's a little bit more here. The acetyl CoA, it also turns out that this is a precursor. It's a necessary cofactor, really. It's not a precursor. The precursor over here is the 5-hydroxytryptophan. The precursor here with this N-acetyl transferase to make this uh, molecule here, which is then uh, has a methyl transferase enzyme working on it to make melatonin here. Melatonin comes from pyruvate. If pyruvate doesn't come into the mitochondria, melatonin is not made. Cancer blocks the process of glucose coming to pyruvate and pyruvate coming into the mitochondria. So when there's cancer going on, you're not making melatonin here. You're not making melatonin here. Melatonin is not available in any part of the cell to block this process where the PDK is being reduced so you can get pyruvate into the mitochondria here. So you have a negative feedback cycle here. How do you break that? You add melatonin to the system. When you add melatonin to the system, it destabilizes this HIF1 alpha, 
which reduces the activity of this kinase, which allows pyruvate to go in here, which produces more ATP, normalizing the cell structure. It, doesn't, it generates enough um, energy without a whole bunch of glucose here. So metabolism just all slows down to normal. And you produce melatonin inside the mitochondria at the same time. So that's how it ought to work. You need melatonin in the system to not have cancer. Which one comes first, the cancer or the melatonin? And I don't really know and I can't answer it and I don't find an answer at this point. But we know if you have cancer, you don't have enough melatonin. That's basically the answer here. So you need to add melatonin to your protocol here. So let's summarize a little bit of what we have here. Melatonin's benefits, you know, that unifying mechanism really might be the reversal of the Warburg effect. And that remains to be seen. That's kind of put out as a hypothesis, as a unifying theme, but it certainly works for cancer. It works for quite a few other diseases as well. Young people, they make a fair bit of melatonin in the dark. And so they don't really need melatonin as much, but it decreases with age. It decreases with poor health as well. If someone is, is in better health as they age, then melatonin, you know, they probably have good levels of melatonin. But after age 50, it seems like supplementing with melatonin is a good idea. There's no negative effects from it, and it's all positive. So you can't really, you can't lose by adding in melatonin here. Now, the reason it's taken a while to, to get around to this webinar is that people have questions about melatonin safety. So is it safe? So the last couple of years, I've been looking out for other safety signals for some good data showing that melatonin isn't safe. And here's what I found out. Really, there isn't a toxic level of melatonin. You can't actually overdose on melatonin. It hasn't been done. There's no LD50, you know, a dose at which 50% of the animals die from the dose. That doesn't exist for melatonin. Melatonin is found in all plants and animals because the mitochondria and the chloroplast both have melatonin in them. They normally exist there. It's a very natural molecule in all of us, in life in general here. Uh, they've done experiments where you give someone melatonin, you're doing an experiment for a month or so, then you quit. And it's not addictive. You know, they don't need melatonin to keep on going to sleep. Nights when I forget to take melatonin, I sleep just fine. It doesn't really affect whether I can sleep or not. I don't take it to help me sleep better. I take it as an antioxidant and to help metabolism work really well. I don't need a Warburg effect. And the other thing is that melatonin doesn't shut off the production of melatonin in the body. You take a supplement and your body still makes melatonin in the mitochondria, still makes melatonin in the pineal gland. The amount from the pineal gland will be dwarfed by how much you take by the supplement but it will still keep on making it. It doesn't make you dependent. Like if you don't take melatonin, your pineal gland is still gonna make melatonin. It's not gonna shut it off. So it's not a hormone in that sense. So what about melatonin and cancer? What would I do if I had cancer? Well, first of all, I would take melatonin because it, it's protective, Whatever, regardless of whatever treatment I wanna take. You know, whether I wanna mix natural therapies with some kind of, you know, uh, focus therapy, and what they call, you know, some people choose some kind of integrative cancer treatment, and they'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and hopefully get the best outcomes. Well, if you add melatonin, it's a great adjuvant in that case, because it helps reduce the, the toxic effects of the other treatments there. So yeah, I would take 20 milligrams at night, I think. That's a super physiological dose. You don't need that much. A milligram at night would even kind of, that would be quite a bit for your body more than your body puts out, even a milligram. But some parts of your body don't have very good blood supply. And 20 milligrams of night would ensure that everything is getting uh, a healthy dose of melatonin there. If I had cancer, and uh, Russell Ryder has brought this up too, well, at night, if you're producing melatonin or taking melatonin, you're reducing the Warburg effect. But what about daytime? Daytime is when they go back to this Warburg effect. If I take just a small dose of melatonin in the daytime, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot. It can be just a very small, little, small dose. 75 micrograms was enough. Every three or four hours, just to get a little bit of melatonin in there, that would be enough to turn cancer cells and they would be under the Warburg effect even in the daytime. 
I'm going to make it a little bit drowsy, perhaps there, but there, there are some liquid melatonins where you can get a very small dose like this, enough to make a difference in the metabolism, but not really to, not so much that would overwhelm your whole system. You would still get a lot more at night. So that's what I would do. I don't know what you would do. You have to figure out your own mind on that. This isn't medical advice. I'm just telling you what I would do if I had cancer there. These are the references of the studies. This is the reference of the, of the study with the leiomyosarcoma, where they took the blood from the women and perfused it across the tumor cells. This is the one with the light at night, where they're doing that. And this is the work from Russell Ryder. And he's written a lot. He's actually been researching melatonin for a long time. If you want to know more about melatonin, look up uh, writer, Russell Ryder, melatonin on YouTube. He's got several good talks there as well. And he talks about melatonin here. He's about 80 years old and he's been studying melatonin for a long time. So it must be mid 80s by now. Because some of the videos I watched were a couple of years back. So thank you. Hope this has been informative. And I guess we have time for some questions here. Dr. Donaldson, that's really uh, definitely inform informative and, and uh, pretty amazing, actually, the information. So one question that comes to my mind automatically is, you know, the sleep is so important and it's a vital part of, of the healing process. And, you know, so often I think between the TVs, the electronics, the, the tele or the phones that everybody's using, um, it's hard to get good quality sleep. And I think, you know, your, your message here in a way is that we really need to make sure that we're blocking the light out during our sleeping hours as well. Is that correct? Yeah, you want to block light out. You want to actually sleep in the dark. Yeah. So, yeah, it, that's important. Just probably not just for melatonin, probably for quite a few different reasons. You want kind of a electronic free area to sleep in, dark, cool, so it's comfortable. And go from there, just, it's important that we underestimate how important that is. And that's what this research is showing too, is that melatonin, you need that to stay healthy. You need quiet, deep sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the uh, um noises that we have especially in the cities and so forth they probably contribute as well to disrupting that whole um, melatonin production yeah there's a there's a lot we didn't know about melatonin um so some of the questions there uh, dr donaldson through the through the chat um and i think you've covered quite a bit of this with determining the optimal dose um and then the, so yeah, i think you've said it you know just kind of doesn't have to be a large amount <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a large amount if you just take a regular melatonin it lasts for about four hours or so between four and five hours, and then your body's back down to physiological levels. If you're taking it at night and your body's also making melatonin, it's going to last longer than that because your body's also making melatonin that it normally would be making. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get kind of a boost in the early part of the night, but you're still going to have elevated melatonin throughout the night because it's the melatonin you're also making. And um, does, is sublingual any better? Um, form of melatonin? If you wanted to act really fast, it would be okay. There's some liquid formulas that would be just as well, you know, just a drop of a liquid would work as well. Okay. Um, and I think that pretty much wraps up the questions from, from the audience. If anybody has any last ones, if you um, set them into us quick, we'll see. Um, if there's anything anything there but we sure appreciate you putting the research together dr donaldson definitely informative um and we we actually don't have any shades on our windows and so especially here you know when cars go by or something um we see some bright lights and 
I think it, uh, you're encouraging me to put some shades up. There you go. Get it dark. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure having you, Dr. Donaldson. Any, any final words? No, I think I said quite a bit here. So you did. It was, Take a look it at was sleep great. at night. Get it, get it dark. And if you're not sure that you're getting, you know, melatonin, and if you're trying to reverse the disease process, I would look into supplementing with it. Just help your help yourself out. And somebody asked about um, melatonin potentially constipating you see anything with that no i haven't seen anything like that um does white help white noise help with the production of melatonin it's only melatonin response to light the receptors in the eyes respond to light so no i don't think it has an effect the noise doesn't okay Somebody who works a night shift, um, would they just, I guess, be taking melatonin when they go to bed during the day? That would, um, yeah, I, you probably can't take too much melatonin when you're trying to get stuff done. Although what I found with melatonin, it doesn't, it doesn't put you to sleep. It's not a sleeping medicine. It's a signal that it's dark outside. So you probably could even at night take a low dose of melatonin. Okay. Because it's dark outside. Makes could, sense. Yeah, I'm not sure that people try it in the daytime. I don't know if that works. If it works for you, I guess you could do it that way. It's just okay. a bit backwards. Yeah. But one way, if you have shift work, one way or the other, you're not getting melatonin. And so the shift work is, is a risk factor for cancer. So one way or the other, you should be getting melatonin every day. And if you can't get it at night, you know, take it in the daytime when you're trying to sleep and reverse, you know, get it someplace there. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Donaldson. And thank you everyone for participating um, this evening and for joining us. This will be uh, recorded and published out in the next uh, few days, probably by the end of the week. And so um, there was a lot of information here. So I um, encourage you to come back and, and review this and make sure you fully understand it. But uh, until next month, we um, pray that you'll be in good health. And um, thank you for joining. Have a good night.